Welcome to season two of This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley, brought to you by the Bold Italic. I'm your host, Sunil Rajaraman, and I'm joined by my co-host, Yasha Kekis-Wolf. Amy Anderson is very well known in the Bay Area for a lot of different reasons, but the kind of first time she came into my line of sight was by reading Vanity Fair, an article on Vanity Fair. Sunil, do you remember that article? Absolutely. And if you've ever heard the term in uh, the Valley, uh, Cougar Night at the uh, at the Rosewood, Amy was at the epicenter of that. Really the, the center point for it. And, and what's interesting about the discussion with Amy is that she thinks about startups in a very different way that at least I would have entered into thinking about startups, right? In fact, the startup that she originally created here in the Bay Area did something that um, is incredibly analog and also kind of fascinating. Scratch and sniff business cards. And, you know, Amy is an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. And uh, I really respect the fact that she took her early network here and built this business, which she's deeply passionate about. Amy, we really appreciate you being here on This Is Your Life in Silicon Valley. And the first question that I want to ask you is, where did you grow up? So I was born in San Francisco and raised in Marin County, so a little town called Mill Valley. Uh, You're like one of three people that were actually born in San Francisco. I know. It's weird, right? (laughs) Yeah. So uh, the Bay Area for you means what? You you lived in Marin. Is Mm -hmm. it Marin? Is it the East Bay? Is it San Francisco? Is it the Peninsula? What's the Bay Area for you? Bay Area for me, I would say, encapsulates Marin, San Francisco, and the Peninsula, where I currently reside and run my business. Um, East Bay, I mean, just growing up, didn't go there so much for whatever reason. Um, maybe it was the intimidation of the bridges or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> don't Have know. you lived anywhere else? Um, Los Angeles for school. Mm-hmm. Where was school? USC. Oh, yes. no. Oh. UC, UCLA for grad school here. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Maybe the podcast should end. <laughs> yeah. Well, I went to Whittier. So LA also. <laughs> well, Claremont, Claremont McKenna undergrad, as you know. So we have the liberal arts thing. So was Marin different than it is today? You know, it always feels like home to me. So it is, in my mind, and kind of my visceral reaction to it, it's, you know, it always feels like home and it's almost so sleepy that when I'm there, I'm actually tired, which sounds strange. Um, Maybe it's just, you know, having grown up there and it is home. It's where my parents are. So it really hasn't changed that much. I mean, there's certainly a new influx of wealth that has come into that community, but a lot of just the original kind of beauty of Marin and and the special places that I used to go to are still there, which is wonderful. Yasha is a Marin County resident. When I lived here 20 years ago and I lived in the peninsula in Menlo Park, and I honestly didn't know you could live and work in the Bay Area in Marin. Right. And nine years in, I'm a complete convert. Like I love, That's amazing. love north of the bridge. I know. It's just, it's so peaceful. It's so beautiful. The the views of Mount Tam there and the water. That is, I will say, the one thing living on the peninsula in Menlo Park. It's hard for me because I really miss those views. I mean, just you cannot beat those at all. Yeah. So I grew up in Oregon. And for me, growing up in Oregon and going to school in Los Angeles was important because I got away from where I grew up. Mm-hmm. You chose to go down to Los Angeles to go to school after having grown up in the Bay Area. Why make that move at all? Opportunity, great school. Um, You know, just it felt like a really excellent school for me um, for what I wanted to do, kind of focusing on communications. So um, I will say just right when I got to basically what was the hood, um, you know, there was helicopters flying over USC. And I was like, I remember crying like, Mom, Dad, don't leave me and like waving goodbye to them, like thinking, what have I done with my life? And I ended up absolutely loving it. But knew after graduation, I was ready to come back to the Bay Area. So got an internship at a public relations firm and just kind of started my job career. And and PR is what you've done forever? That's what you knew you wanted to do when you got out of school? It was a paid internship, took it, just kind of needed some job experience. And um, this was during the dot-com boom. So it was just such an exciting time to be in San Francisco 
back then in 99 with so many dot-com parties and networking and interesting entrepreneurs, meeting cool people, attending events literally every night. Um, So the PR thing was very random, good opportunity, um, nice company. But ultimately, I quit that to start my own startup. Back then, I was a 21-year-old founder CEO with scratch and sniff business cards. Wow, that's that's interesting. So scratch and sniff business cards. You heard about you heard about the companies trying to get you to bump iPhones and exchange information. Why hasn't the business card been killed? They're everywhere. They're still everywhere. They're an essential part of our life. They are. And I think people like them. It's just part of kind of the initial, you know, meet and greet. It's it's just kind of a social norm that you just pass them out, I guess. But you're right. It is kind of ironic and strange that they haven't been completely evaporated from, you know, just networking in general. But I will say my scratch and stiff business cards were very popular at networking events because I would pass them to venture capitalists. No, smell it. It's tutti frutti. Oh, that's, <laughs> They're that's like, so okay. I love business cards. What, like what's the paper stock thickness for your current paper cards? Ooh, you're asking very technical questions. Um, It's pretty thick <laughs> <laughs> good 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 enough answer yeah good right? enough answer you know I, as much as i want to talk to you about business cards amy for the listeners out there everyone wants to know what is it that you do so i'm a professional matchmaker i've been running my business called lynx dating l-i-n-x dating for now a little over 14 years so i developed the idea when i moved to palo alto it was my first time really ever on the peninsula having grown up in marin um back in 2000 i was in a really serious relationship with somebody who is kind of this quintessential silicon valley guy you know three or four masters from stanford that sort of thing just a real underachiever type. And we would just network with a lot of his friends who were all very single back then. And it dawned on me that there was something really unusual with the social landscape of the Silicon Valley. Is it that we're all antisocial and wear hoodies? There is that element, certainly, that does Lots exist. Of a lot of introverts, a lot of people just in their head a lot, thinking constantly, overanalyzing every detail. But I just realized that there was a dearth of eligible women in Silicon Valley. And that was kind of my aha moment that I thought, okay, there's all these men down here and they all seem to be very single and there's not a lot of women. Where are the women? And I saw a very similar trend in San Francisco with so many of my female friends who were all professional, well-educated, interesting women, legitimately struggling, trying to find a good match. So that was kind of the genesis of what is now Lynx. Why do you think that's true in the Bay Area? Or actually, maybe a different question is, is Is that true everywhere or is it unique in the Bay Area? I think it's definitely unique to the Bay Area, just that really unusual disparity in the ratio of the genders. But one could argue that it's probably similar in different metropolitan regions. I mean, I think in general, metropolitan regions, whether it's LA, New York, Chicago, they all have their challenges when it comes to dating. Um, But I think I think this, being the Bay Area, is definitely unusual that way. As you say that, you're kind of, I don't want to say cringing because that's the wrong characterization, but you have this look on your face like, okay, there's, yeah, you know, like it's, it's, it's not easy. What, what is that look? It is a, it's not easy kind of look. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, you can imagine I have had conversations with thousands of people and clients at this stage in the game. And I hear and I see so much and I feel people's frustration and their and their pain and just kind of them wanting results in this rat race. You know, everybody's working so much here. Um, and then there's certainly a lot of ways for people to connect with other individuals vis-a-vis the apps or online dating. And they go through these struggles through those different resources. So as I'm talking, I'm kind of like playing this tape in my mind, you know, just all these different stories that I hear from so many of my clients, just realizing that the Bay Area is really difficult for dating. So why do this work? So, you know, it it feels like, you know, you know, you've been doing this for a long time now, 15 years. What, what meaning do you derive from this work that you want to keep going and doing it? Well, I will say it's really hard work. So it is probably some of the most emotionally taxing work that I 
ever imagined for myself. But one of the reasons why I do this is I, number one, I love getting to work with who I get to work with. I learn something from everybody that I encounter, which is one of the greatest gifts, I think. And really being able to change people's lives for better. I mean, I I try to make these matches work. And of course, not everyone does work, but the ones that do work and really transforming people's lives where they meet the, the partner of their dreams and build a family with them is just the most rewarding experience ever. I got a question. So maybe I'll paint a picture first. Mm -hmm. Part of my experience in the Bay Area has been appreciating the community because there's a willingness to have that first meeting Mm -hmm. professionally. And that first meeting is, hey, uh, let me tell you about some things that I think are important that I need. And then you on the receiving end of that says, okay, I can decide if I want to invest some time so that I can have a transactional relationship with you. And I think the Bay Area is really good at that. Like we're really good at the transactional relationships. Mm -hmm. But there's a superficiality that I think kind of floats around that idea. You said that you get to meet people and learn about kind of them and maybe learn things that are interesting for you individually. What happens past that transactional meeting? Like how do you actually do it? How do you get past the BS that shows up in that first meeting where we're all trying to puff our chests up and say how important we are and give the good handshakes? Who I don't, I don't, I don't know who does. You that. don't do that. I wasn't looking directly at you, Samuel. Oh, okay. okay. I was looking in your direction. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Well, I've gotten really good at weeding out the noise. So people will often come up with a whole long list of objective criteria that they're looking for and certainly try to put their best foot forward and impress me and often say the right things that they think I want to hear. But I kind of cut through that and extract key elements that I feel that hopefully new client is going to be looking for. And that's really, it's very hard to explain because so much of that is based on intuition, right? That If you were to ask sense. Sunil a couple of questions as an initial candidate, what, like, what do you start? I, and I'm not trying to be a jerk about this, but like, where do you, where do you start? And to be clear, first- married, two kids. So nice. this is, this is so just for, for I'm like, personally, I'm really fascinated in this idea of how do you cut through that clutter? Because it, there is so much puffery that happens. And it, I don't think it's unique to the Bay Area, but it certainly shows up here a lot. For like, sure. How do you, do you try and put people on, on their heels? Is it kind of trying to empathize with them? Like, how do you go at asking a set of questions to Sunil? Well, I would begin with just, you know, getting to know you where we would talk about what you've currently been doing for dating. I mean, what is it like? Um, i get into the dynamics of your past relationship, some of the pros, some of the cons, and then we'd start to kind of build a framework about the type of person that you're looking for. And we'd start with kind of the superficial elements, such as maybe the physical appearance, height, background, ethnicity, and then kind of build from there with personality and really get that prospect or new client talking about what they're looking for. So it's very kind of almost free association. Um, And I'm starting to kind of create this archetype in my mind and in my database for them. And so you're like a therapist. Very much. Mm -hmm. But you also said, uh, I'm a marketer, and you said a marketing buzzword. We have to start to develop the framework. Is that like your application of the therapy that you conduct with your clients Mm -hmm. because of the Bay Area? Or what do you mean by framework? Um, Well, really, kind of by the framework, it is creating kind of a, I guess it could be a foundation to work from. And that is how I do my matching. You know, this is largely derived from the metrics that clients are looking for, such as all the science behind this, height, hair color, personality, religion, um, if they've been married before or not. But so much of the matches then are the intuition, right? So it's kind of the combination of science meets art. But I have to build a really strong foundation. So that's kind of the framework. And that is often derived from key elements that I feel somebody really needs for a very successful, long-term, sustainable relationship. Um, And that is case by case. Everybody's different, right? I just had a conversation with a great guy today. And he's coming out of a difficult marriage and, you know, going through divorce. And um, his wife was not faithful and and so on. And so kind of starting to build that framework, I was thinking, okay, loyalty, integrity in the next partner, you know, really certainly he needs to be attracted, the physical appearance, but more so her character. So thinking through that as I get to know each prospect. So this seems a little bit counterintuitive because, you know, so when you started this business, it was pre, pre-iPhone, pre pre-Tinder, mm-hmm. pre-all of that. And here we are in this age of transactional dating. How has that changed your business, if it has at all? It's been very interesting. So 
with the rise of all the online dating choices and all the apps, it's actually really helped my business a lot because it's brought clarity and um, recognition to this industry, this little cottage industry that I represent for matchmakers offline. And it's actually, it's helped too because I'm seeing a trend where a lot of people are getting off the apps and online because they're simply exhausted. They're experiencing a real dating fatigue from it. So that's really helped my business as well, kind of get new customers and provide individuals with an additional resource. As we were researching your business, and uh, Yasha has this look on his face for our listeners who just, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of, you know, we're I getting warm. I just wanted warm, to but... ask you, Sunil, have you ever been on Tinder? My wife and I talk about this because neither of us, we started dating before and got married before they even, that Pre, app existed. I was, I was before. I've never been on it. Yeah, so uh, we're we're definitely not not up to speed. Maybe Tyler, our audio engineer, perhaps has been on some of those apps. So you can just nod your. He's nodding. <laughs> yes. There's conflicting information as we were doing our research for this interview. How much you charge for your services? I've seen articles that quote some pretty interesting numbers, lofty prices. I want to hear from you. Mm-hmm. What's your business model, and what do you charge? So my business is membership-based, and there's two tiers of membership. Either you are passive in my database where you are not my client, and as a result, there's not a guarantee of introductions. You are, for lack of a better word, glorified kind of inventory, but it's very important because you've been qualified and with Amy's stamp of approval, and there's no fees for that. So it's been really instrumental in creating a very robust database to have those passive members. Then if somebody wants a guarantee of introductions, that's when they become a premium client. And it really is completely customized according to what that new client is looking for. I have memberships where I match client to client, and I have memberships that have become really popular where I'm matching client to anyone in the world. So where I'm recruiting on behalf of what becomes a VIP client. So to answer your question, fees range anywhere from $2,500 upward of half a million dollars for some clients that are looking for literally a needle in a haystack, which is outrageous. How how do you do it? Is it just you? This is just me, which is crazy at times. (laughs) It, It feels very... Very crazy, but it's all been done on purpose. Um, I outsource a lot of help. So I have somebody who writes content for me, somebody who does my website, um, a virtual assistant who works for me part-time, therapists, date coaches, stylists. Um, But day-to-day operationally, it's me. What's a date coach? Date coaching is really instrumental for a lot of people that just need to get kind of prepped for their matchmaking experience. Um, An example could be somebody who has not dated in a while, needs just some tidbits about, you know, the way men think or the way women think um, so that they can feel really confident when they're sent out on their introductions. So all different examples, or maybe somebody who's just fresh out of a divorce, um, just giving them two hours of coaching so they feel, again, really confident and ready to just tackle the dating world in this new chapter. Where are the better people, Marin or San Francisco or the Peninsula? Well, I think commitment-minded men are in Silicon Valley and maybe Marin too. I think when you get out of a city in general, people's mentality shifts a bit where they're just more focused on finding that partner and not necessarily prone to playing some games. Well, let's let's dig into that a little bit more. So quirks of Silicon Valley uh, working in this in this particular market. What do you see that's sort of some darker things that you see. I mean, so you hear a lot about drug use, you hear a lot about different lifestyle choices, things like that. Can you tell us what you see? Like, what are some of those more interesting things that you see? Well, I certainly have had quite a few women um, come into my office, and we're talking about extremely high caliber, very academically driven um, professional women that just are very bummed out how they want a quote-unquote normal monogamous relationship. And that's been really hard to find, I think, for these individuals. They have been kind of subject to a lot of polyamory and polyamorous relationships, which have become very popular, I think, um, from what I'm told. Um, and I think that's, you know, just a well, lot. Well, from of, what you've mm-hmm, been told, let's mm-hmm. just let's just dig into that. Like, is it more common than not in, say, San Francisco? I think so. Wow. Mm-hmm. I okay. think so. I think it's 
I'm not going to say pretty common, but a lot of people will tell me that men and women will just put that out there on their online profiles or the dating apps, just saying, this is what I'm looking for. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any other quirks or sort of things that are uh, not obvious that you see? Well, in the context of dating, I mean, I see so many different things where it's just so many Silicon Valley types get really tripped up in the early stages of dating. You know, they're trying to impress, they're trying to peacock and puff out their chest and name drop. You know, I've had clients brag about their friends like Zuck and Elon and so forth on the first date. And women are like, okay, that's impressive, but they peg that individual as insecure or just, you know, not the right match for them. So that would never happen to Yasha if you right. were if you were single now. He doesn't you strike were, me as the You were type. looking over me when she said peacocking. <laughs> <laughs> like you're just adding to the complex that I have. But at least she validated that people from Marin mm-hmm. are better than people from the wherever you live. Yeah, San Mateo, San Mateo on Peninsula. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you not see the same kind of behavior as quirks, uh, uh, kinks? in Los Angeles or in Chicago or New York? Well, I'm certainly not as familiar with those markets. I mean, my domain is the Bay Area. Um, I Let's just say I get a lot of women from Los Angeles who write me, I mean, just hundreds weekly, um, beautiful, uh, professional women crying out to meet a good gainfully employed man. I mean, that's literally, wow. I mean, baseline, that's what they're looking for. It's and a low bar. Maybe not. Yeah, that's well, a rude thing. Shockingly <laughs> low bar. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's it's interesting. And, I mean, these are dermatologists. There are attorneys down there. And I'm not necessarily kind of the stereotypical model or actress. I'm just great, well-educated, interesting, dynamic women. So it is kind of, I guess, a low bar. Um, but I think that market for them is really challenging, trying to navigate that. So, you know, knowing what you know now, and you're you're married, right, and you have, and you have a family— would you date, if you were single, a man from the Silicon Valley? Oh, from the Silicon Valley? I probably would. Mm-hmm. San Francisco, maybe not so much. <laughs> ah, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Just, just a big, big distinction there. Um, and so that's, that's, that's fascinating. So you, you pitch on your website, um, no apps, no algorithms, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. intuition. Why that decision for you? Mm-hmm. Like if you could scale and make your business bigger, why wouldn't you go that route? It's the million dollar question, right? Everybody asks about scalability. Well, if somebody wants to help me figure that out, God bless them and, and please email me. Um, but I'm very, you know, I'm traditional. I'm not a techie. When I first started my business, uh, and I was with my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, um, he asked me how I was staying organized. And he's like, well, you must have a really great database. What are you doing? And I said, I don't have anything like that. I have flashcards. And he's like, what are you talking about? You have flashcards. And he went to my apartment and it was like a scene out of a beautiful mind with like thousands of like flashcards everywhere. And he's like, this is really scary. We're going to build you a database. And I didn't know what that was. I was like, okay, <laughs> sure. That sounds great. And that really kind of transformed everything. So as an entrepreneur and as my business is evolving, I'm always open to different ideas and certainly implementing technology. But I do do think there is really something to the human touch, the personalization of working with an offline matchmaker that so many of the techies and other individuals that I work with are craving, you know, because they are getting away from the technology when it comes to finding love and really entrusting an individual, right? Yeah, no, de- definitely. And what's interesting is that people still want to use a traditional matchmaking mm-hmm. service in search of this human connection because mm-hmm. it feels like people are getting more and more disconnected and antisocial mm-hmm. in general. I also think the appeal is introducing my clientele to just different social networks. I mean, that's definitely the appeal um, for a lot of people where they just want to kind of get out of their existing network of friends and be able to be introduced to just a totally different demographic. And that's very appealing, especially when I vetted everybody. So you can't emphasize the vetting enough. What's the percentage of people that ultimately get into your system of people who apply? Um, Well, my business has really evolved, actually. So 
my business years ago, I was working with a much higher volume of clientele, and now I'm preferring to focus on a handful of VIP clients, and the rest um, are individuals who are passive in my database. So it just really is kind of situational and on a case-by-case basis. But I turn away a lot of business, let's just say that, because um, number one, I can't represent everybody. And also a lot of women write me. I get way more responses and hits to my site from the ladies than I do the guys, which seems very counterintuitive to Silicon Valley. I mean, I think that always surprises people, but there's a lot more women. And I think that is primarily because just the way women communicate a little bit differently than men, you know, we tend to be more open about the intricate of our personal lives and how we're meeting guys. You know, I'm on Tinder, I'm doing Hinge, I'm trying Bumble, I'm doing Links, that sort of thing. Whereas I think you guys tend to be a little bit more private and closed off. By you guys, she's looking at you. Both, exactly. (laughs) I'm very introverted. So uh, maybe not controversial, but is all the stuff that everybody talks about with the Rosewood true? Well, so for those listening, the Rosewood, it's become a pretty iconic hotel um, in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley. And I had thrown an event there when they first opened back in 2009, one of my Lincoln Drink mixers. And then Vanity Fair did a story about them kind of um, calling it Cougar Night, um, which when that story came out, I was really angry. I'm just thinking Cougar, the Cougar matchmaker, that's not what I do. But it actually has really helped my business a lot because people still talk about it. It's like this urban legend. So it is true. If you go on any Thursday, especially when the weather is nice because the bar trickles out onto this beautiful patio overlooking the Santa Cruz Mountains, and there's a lot of people there. Um, I was there last Thursday just for research, of course, (laughs) Um, and there was probably about a 1,000 people there just mingling like women in inappropriate dresses, men of all ages, um, people just wanting to check out the action. So, Yasha, you're not going to go there for research. I don't even go across the bridge except for work. (laughs) Never would happen. You know, we've covered a lot of ground in the discussion today. And one of the things that we like to end on is to drop the seed where we'd love for you to tell us and and our listeners who it is that you're paying attention to on social networks. Like Mm. who should – they listen to or mm-hmm. watch or read or, 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 or. Nice. Well, I tend to geek out on a lot of things about outer space. So I follow a lot of the astronauts on Instagram, oh, okay. <laughs> which is which is really fun. So they take the most beautiful images of the world and, you know, wherever they're flying over. And I just love to see that photography. So that's kind of my thing. Um, one of my just nerdy things that I enjoy – um, but beyond that, just who I'm following, it's so diverse from, you know, just pop culture, you know, individuals to, um, you know, models and actresses and all sorts of things. I have a closing question sure. for you. And we'll just kind of do like a little fast paced one because you're a professional matchmaker, just hypothetically. And these people, to disclose, they're not necessarily clients of Amy's. But if these people were single or assuming they are, who would you match them with? And I'm going to name a couple of prominent Silicon Valley people. Okay. If Mark Zuckerberg were single, Mm -hmm. who would you match him with? Mark Zuckerberg right now or from years ago? Now. 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 Okay. Um, Testimony Zuckerberg. Yeah, Mm post-testimony. Well, he's going to need somebody, obviously, incredibly brilliant um, who can challenge him but also treat him like a human um, and is clearly not with him for his billions of dollars. So that's a really hard one. Um, I would probably aim for somebody who's just a normal girl um, but doing really interesting things in her life. Um, I've got to say, I think he did find a really good match with Priscilla, you know, because she's obviously so smart and seems incredibly down to earth and humanitarian and doing just such great things um, career wise. So, yeah, that's that is a tough one, though. Oh, my goodness. Well, I think he kind of has a thing for models, um, very beautiful women. So I would definitely be um, putting my fishing line down in Los Angeles for him, I think, or New York. Um, And again, somebody really smart who's going to be cerebral yet can just kind of check him. You know, I think he needs somebody to kind of keep him on his toes because he's so used to kind of maybe controlling things in general and just um, needs somebody to um, inject some humor into his 
his life. So good personality, very beautiful, and just fun in general. And also who's going to be comfortable with a large family. I mean, he has six kids or something, or maybe seven. I don't think I knew that. Seven now it. or something. Yeah, <laughs> he has a lot. He keeps them off of Instagram. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, keeps the flamethrowers on, mm-hmm. keeps the kids off. Last mm-hmm. one, how about Kara Swisher? Kara Swisher. Well, again, I think you need somebody very intellectual, right, to keep up with her because she's so smart and interfacing, just meeting with so many fascinating people. So somebody confident. Um, Again, I just keep saying kind of the down-to-earth thing, just somebody very real and um, approachable who's not going to be with her for knowing the types of people that she is interviewing and meeting with on a daily basis, right? So... Fair. So we put you on the spot with that one, but I, f- I figured figured we'd ask. Uh, Amy, it was wonderful having you here oh, today. Oh, thank you this so much. This was a really fun conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank Thanks you. Being here. Thank you. I am I'm still in shock to deal that it costs as much as it does to go to college as it does to hire a dating service like Amy's Dating Service. You know, I mean, it's the most important life decision that you make, and why not throw a little extra money on it? Are you getting a commission? I'm just looking at the ROI, and uh, I'm not endorsing any specific services. If you've enjoyed this podcast and just generally enjoy Sunil as much as I do, on the podcast app that you found our podcast on, please go back and rate it five stars. 